Okay, we're back for the second um, uh, video lecture on uh, chapter four, uh, uh, the uh, tour of the cell. So I think we ended here, cell and surfaces. We talked about the four plant cells of a cell wall made of cellulose fibers, uh, which, which is insoluble fiber for us. Plant cells protect the cells, maintain cell shape, keep cells from absorbing too much water. Animal cells remember do not have cell walls, but they secrete a sticky coat called the extracellular matrix. And surfaces of most animal cells contain cell junctions that actually hold cells together, allow cell communication, and also stop things from dripping between cells. Okay. Now I think the next few slides are uh, looking at the uh, way some People found uh, uh, new antibiotics. Remember, we always have to come up with new antibiotics, but I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this one experiment to find new uh, antibiotics. I could like just jump into the nucleus and ribosomes genetic control of the cell. So, nucleus, control center of the cell, right? Um, that's where your uh, parental chromosomes are found. And remember, it's only found in eukaryotic cells. Um, and uh, uh, chromosomes are composed of a strand of DNA that has genes along it in a linear array. And each gene, I think I mentioned this before, is a stretch of DNA that stores the information necessary to produce a protein. And proteins do the actual work in the cell, actually. All of uh, our characteristics we say it are genetic, but it's not the genes that do the work. It's the proteins made uh, from the information found in the gene that do, do the work. Okay. Nucleus is a membrane bounded organelle, okay, which is the hallmark of eukaryotic cells. And it's separated from the cytoplasm by a double membrane called the nuclear envelope. And the nuclear envelope has big pores in it because a big molecule is going to have to come out of that. Uh, uh, well, big molecules come in and out of the nucleus. And there are the pores right there. Pores in will allow certain materials to pass between the nucleus and the surrounding cytoplasm, particularly what's called an RNA molecule that's going to come out of the uh, nucleus, carry information from a gene and go into a ribosome to be translated into a protein. Okay, so long DNA molecules and associated proteins. These proteins are called histone proteins, uh, form fibers called chromatin. So that's the stuff inside a nucleus uh, is chromatin. Each long chromatin fiber constitutes one chromosome. Okay? And um, the number of chromosomes is uh, different for every species, maybe it's not different for every species, but um, it's uh, what's, what's called the uh, diploid number. How many chromosomes do you have in your cells? Well, our number is 46. We have 46 chromosomes. If a chimpanzee would be 48. If you're an onion, it would be 16. If you're a fruit fly, it would be four. It's always even because you get the same number of chromosomes from both parents. So it's always even. Um, now, the nucleus is a structure within the nucleus. Um, it's a site where the components of chromosome or ribosomes are made. But also, there's something called RNA processing, which we're going to get to later on when we get in the, into the actual way proteins are made. There's the nucleus, uh, the chromatin inside, nuclear envelope, nucleolus, and nuclear pore. Relationship between DNA, chromatin, and chromosome, there's a DNA molecule. And there's the histone proteins. And the DNA is wrapped around several times around this group of four histone proteins. And another group of four that's wrapped around that, another group of four that's wrapped around that. And then it's, and then it's supercoiled and forms a uh, chromosome. Okay. Now, when the cell's not um, divided, you can't see the chromosomes. But they become supercoiled um, just before cell division, mitosis, and you can see them under a microscope in um, 
uh, during mitosis. And that's been one of our labs, as a matter of fact, is we'll be looking at uh, what the chromosomes are doing during cell division, during mitosis. So ribosomes, responsible for protein synthesis, and they're found in every cell on Earth. Uh, in eukaryotic cells, uh, the components of ribosomes are made in the nucleus, and then transported to pores and nuclear envelope into cytoplasm, where the ribosomes do the work. We find out that there are free ribosomes in the cytoplasm, and there are also ribosomes on a structure called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And this is outside uh, the nucleus. Some ribosomes make proteins that remain within the cytosol. Other ribosomes make proteins that incorporate the membranes or secreted by the cell. And these are going to be uh, proteins that are made by what's called the rough endoplasmic, endoplasmic particular or the rough ER. Here's a computer model of a ribosome in the process of synthesizing a protein. We're going to see that there's a molecule called mRNA that is a copy of a gene in the nucleus, and it's, um, it's going to be read and translated, that information, uh, by a ribosome. ER bound ribosomes. So there's the endoplasmic reticulum. It's a, it's a long series of back and forth uh, membranes with a space in between the membranes. Um, and um, it's called a rough ER because on the microscope it looks rough because there are these, it's studded all the way along with ribosomes. And dangerous proteins, that is like digestive proteins that could be dangerous, are made in that protected space. And also proteins that are secreted from the cell, like protein hormones, are made in the rough ER. Okay, so how this works, DNA transfers this coded information to a molecule called mRNA. This is one of uh, several different RNA uh, molecules we're gonna be discussing. And each one does a, a separate thing in protein synthesis. It, uh, it copies, uh, there's a molecule called uh, uh, RNA polymerase that makes a copy, RNA copy of a gene in the nucleus. And then it, it comes off, exits the nucleus through pores in the nuclear envelope, travels to the cytoplasm, and binds to the ribosome. So that copying of the gene is called transcription. And then um, the ribosome moves along the mRNA, translating the genetic message into a protein with a specific amino acid sequence. So that's called translation. And that happens uh, at a ribosome. So there is the uh, uh, information superhighway, I call it, in, uh, in a uh, cell, DNA to RNA to protein. Synthesis of mRNA and nucleus, and I said called transcription. Now, now it's leaving out one step called RNA processing. We'll get to that later on. But an mRNA is made in the nucleus. It leaves the nucleus, moving the mRNA into cytoplasm via nuclear pore. Synthesis of protein in the cytoplasm at a uh, ribosome. So, uh, the genetic measures contain in DNA is used to build proteins. Which major theme is illustrated by this action? It looks like um, information flow. This is information. Uh, that's what's in the in gene, is the information on the amino acid sequence of a particular protein. So we can talk about what's called the endomembrane system. Endo meaning inside internal membranes, the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, something else called the Golgi apparatus. And this is a series of stacked membranes where uh, proteins are finished. You know, when they're made, the, sometimes when they're made the ribosome, they're not really completely finished yet. They, things have to be added to them, sometimes things have to be taken off. And this happens in the Golgi apparatus. Then lysosomes, are the recycling center of the cell. 
uh, something uh, organ alloy is broken or something, it's sent in there and it's taken apart, and uh, things that can be reused or reused, things that can't be or thrown away. And vacuums are just um, vesicles. Uh, um, Phospholipid uh, spaces, um, and uh, they're mostly found in uh, plant cells, and usually they're filled with some kind of uh, watery fluid and sometimes food. Membrane, membranous organelles are either physically connected or linked by vesicles, sacs made of membrane. So yeah, protein made in the, in the rough ER uh, gets put into this vesicle, vesicle goes to the cytoplasm, merges with the membrane of the Golgi apparatus for the protein to be finished. Oh, well, we've already, done, we've already looked at the idealized animal cells and plant cells. Okay, getting back to, to, to these things, uh, endoplasmic reticulum uh, produces enormous variety of molecules connected to the nuclear envelope and is composed of interconnected rough and smooth ER that have different functions, uh, structures and functions. Is a smooth ER that actually makes lipids, when lipids are made. There's the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth. And so, uh, and then there's an nuclear envelope up there, and mRNA comes into that space inside the, 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 the membrane space inside the ER. And this mRNA goes to ribosome on that, uh, membrane and is, and is translated. Okay, so why are someone's attached to rough ER, as I mentioned again, I'm repeating myself here, uh, makes proteins that will be inserted into the ER membrane, transport to other organelles, and eventually export it. Some products manufactured by rough ER are chemically modified and then packaged into transport vesicles. And these transport vessels are, can be sent to other parts of the cell, particularly the Golgi apparatus. So there, a ribosome links amino acids, proteins are modified in the ER, uh, secreted proteins are detached, and this vesicle buds off in this transport vesicle, which will bring the protein to another place in the cell. Okay, smooth RNA R produces um, lipids, including steroids, and helps liver cells detoxify drugs. The Golgi apparatus receives, refines, stores, distributes chemical product to the cell. Usually, it's a protein. It's a protein that has to be modified uh, in order for it to be completely functional. Okay. Place the following cellular structures in the order they would be in the production and secretion of a protein. Okay, first nucleus, right? Uh, then uh, a ribosome, uh, then uh, transport vesicle, uh, then Golgi apparatus the, to plasma membrane. No, wait, I think that's wrong. Um, nucleus. Then uh, we're going to go to a uh, ribosome, then to the Golgi apparatus, then to the transport vesicle, and then to the plasma membrane. And this transport vesicle will merge with the, with the cell membrane to export the protein from the cell. So there's the Golgi apparatus. So it receives vesicles from the rough ER, uh, gets them. Um, and uh, so it has a receiving side and a shipping side, and shipping side forms these vesicles that will merge with the plasma membrane, as I mentioned, and export the protein from the cell. So what different organelles work together to carry out instructions in DNA, which major theme in this, uh, interactions within biology systems, I would say. So these, these uh, different parts of the endomembrane system are working together to make and export a protein from the cell. I mentioned lysosome 
membrane close sac of digestive enzymes. Uh, plant cells we don't have uh, lysosomes. They can break down large molecules like proteins, polysaccharides, fats, and quick acids, break them down in the individual monomers, and then you can reuse them. They can also destroy harmful bacteria. So um, you can engulf a bacteria or immune cells that engulf bacteria, uh, put them into a lysosome, and the digestive enzymes completely destroy, digest the bacteria, and completely destroy it. Also, scope tissue doing embryonic development, helping to form structures such as fingers. This is called apoptosis, uh, uh, programmed cell death. Um, and that is, and that's actually pretty important. You think of, uh, you know, you, uh, um, differentiating as, a, as an embryo into a fetus and then into a, into a person that's born. Um, you, you gotta make cells, you gotta make a lot of cells, but you also have to kill cells, you have to destroy cells to make certain structures. The, the, uh, and the part of it is the webbing between your fingers. If you look at a, a fetus, it's got webbed fingers. And those uh, cells kill themselves that are between the, the webbing, the cells in the webbing kill themselves by opening up their lysosomes and digesting themselves from the inside out. And that's how um, those, that webbing gets destroyed. Okay. Well, in a certain really serious genetic disorder, it's called lysosomal storage diseases, and they're really bad and they're fatal in children. We'll talk more about um, you know, genetic disease uh, later on when we get into more into genetics. So uh, two functions of lysosomes, digesting food, breaking down the molecules of a damaged organelle. Right. Vacuoles are large vesicles or a variety of functions. Food vacuoles bud from the plasma membrane and certain freshwater proteins have contractile vacuoles that, that swell up with water and push water up. Swell up with water and push water up. So there's a, a a central vacuum in a plant cell that, that has uh, probably a, a food in it. And there's a contractile vacuum in the paramecium. Vacuum fills up with water and contraction pushes the water up. Okay, as I mentioned, it keeps on saying, stores organic nutrients, absorb water, contains pigments that attract pollinating insects or poisons that protect against plant eating animals. And central vacuum of a plant cell. So here's a review of the endomembrane system. So it could be asked if you, uh, a question, you know, which of these is a member of, or not a member of the endomembrane system. Uh, the nucleus, remember it's part of it, the rough ER, uh, the transport vesicles, the Golgi apparatus, and the plasma membrane. Okay, one of the central um, things of biology is the transformation of energy, how it en enters living systems, converted from one form to another, and eventually given off as heat. Uh, and we're, uh, we're gonna have a whole chapter actually on energy and, and uh, different uh, ways energy is uh, combined and used and changed. But one central thing is where you cannot um, make or destroy energy. You just transform it. Uh, you transform energy, you can use energy to do work, and then it's eventually transformed as heat, and then leaves your body, and then you get, uh, gotta get more energy into your body in the, in the way of food. So two organelles act as cellular power stations, chloroplasts in plants, and mitochondria in animals and plants. I mean, like mitochondria in all eukaryotes have mitochondria, but only um, autotrophic organisms have chloroplasts, and that would be plants or some proteins that are photosynthetic. Now, there are also photosynthetic bacteria, but they do photosynthesis in a different way. They don't use chloroplasts because it's a membrane bounded organelle. Both these are membrane bounded organelles. So, most of the living world runs on energy provided by photosynthesis. Um, even if you're like a pure meat eater, you never, you never eat plants, you're still dependent upon photosynthesis. 
because you eat an animal that ate the plants, you know, that made the food. Plants and the photosynthetic organisms, they make the food. So it's, a, so it's a conversion of light energy from the sun to the chemical energy of sugar and other organic molecules. So this energy can be in different forms, light energy, and then this chemical energy. Chemical energy is, uh, is the energy of, of electrons. Light energy is the energy of photons. And that can be co converted to the chemical energy of electrons. Because actually photons and electrons are like really similar. We know that, that remember electrons don't have any mass, they're little bundles of pure energy. So are photons. And the photons can be converted into the, uh, the energy of the photons can be uh, converted into the energy of electrons. So chloroplasts are unique to the photosynthetic cells of plants and algae, the protestants, and they're the organelles that perform photosynthesis. And we're gonna have a whole chapter on photosynthesis. We're also going to have a whole chapter on cellular respiration, which is the process that happens inside mitochondria. So chloroplast, cytophotosynthesis, has these inner outer membranes. It's got a, a double membrane around it uh, called a thylakoid membrane. And in between and a stack of these thylakoid membranes called a gram. Mitochondria are found in almost all eukaryotic cells. Matter of fact, they're found in every eukaryotic cell, except uh, one um, a protestin that's a uh, uh, that's actually a sexually transmitted disease called chlamydia. It, that, it doesn't have my, mitochondria. It's bizarre. It's a eukaryote without mitochondria. When it infects you, it uses your mitochondria to make its ATP. Okay. Well, the organelles in which cellular respiration takes place it produces ATP from the energy of food molecules. Adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency for all life on Earth. You take in energy in the, in the form of food, but it's not in the right form. That energy of your food, of the electrons in your food, has to be converted to the energy of ATP, that molecule. So cells use the molecules of ATP as a direct energy source for most of their work. Okay, explain what is wrong with the following statement. Plant cells have chloroplasts, animal cells have mitochondria. Actually, on a basis, that's, that's, that's correct. But the important thing is that it gives the impression, and a lot of people think this, some even biologists think that, that you know, plant cells have chloroplasts, animal cells have mitochondria. Well, no. Plant cells have chloroplasts and mitochondria. All eukaryotes have, have mitochondria, except for that, that one strange protein called chlamydia. They all have mitochondria, but only plants and algae have got the chloroplasts. Because think of it this way, plants like us need energy every second you're alive. You need energy, you, you have to do work. And later on, we'll talk about what biological work is. You have to work every second you're alive, you're working to stay alive. So every second you need ATP, right? A certain amount of ATP. You're working harder, you need more ATP. You're not working harder, you need less, but you always need some. And where's the plant gets ATP from? From the sun, from sunlight. It makes ATP from the energy in sunlight. And it makes uh, glucose. And it stores the glucose away as starch. So what happens uh, when the sun goes down? I mean, when night comes by? Well, photosynthesis turns off. You can't do photosynthesis without light. So there's no photosynthesis going on at night. But plants need uh, ATP every second they're alive like we do. So then they have to switch to cellular respiration and use the mitochondria to make enough ATP to keep themselves alive until the sun comes up the next morning. Um, and also during the winter time right now, those trees out there, they don't have any leaves. Well, that's where photosynthesis takes place in the leaves, not in the twigs, not in the bark or the trunk takes place in the leaves. So over the whole winter, the trees are staying alive by, make, by making ATP using the mitochondria. 
Unfortunately, so they, you know, they make oxygen as a waste product of, for, of photosynthesis, but they also use oxygen because uh, they're aerobic organisms uh, when they're not doing photosynthesis. But fortunately, they make a lot more oxygen in photosynthesis than they use in mitochondria. So there's a net gain of oxygen to the uh, environment. So mitochondria is site of cellular respiration. It's a cigar-shaped molecule. It has an inner and outer membrane, and these cristae are folds in the membrane. Uh, and the matrix is the stuff between, uh, in, inside uh, the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And it's really a, a, called a powerhouse of the cell. It's where most ATP is made in aerobic organisms. Um, now, uh, uh, there are some organisms that are not aerobic, they're anaerobic. They never use oxygen, never use this stuff. But they don't have mitochondria because they're all uh, uh, prokaryotes. Uh, uh, so there's some uh, uh, bacteria that are called anaerobic, they don't use oxygen, uh, and they wouldn't have a mitochondria anyway because it's a membrane bounded organelle. All aerobic organisms, uh, all, air, all aerobic eukaryotes need a mitochondria. They're also aerobic bacteria, but they make ATP, but they don't use oxygen to do it. Um, well, of course they use uh, uh, but they, but they, uh, they make it in a different way, not in mitochondria. Okay. Um, here's the interesting thing. Chloroplast mitochondria contain their own DNA. They have a chromosome inside the DNA that encodes some of their proteins made by their own ribosomes. They have ribosomes also. Uh, they contain, uh, each chloroplast and mitochondria contains a single circular DNA uh, chromosome that re resembles a prokaryotic chromosome and can grow and pitch into re reproducing themselves as bacteria do. As a matter of fact, it's really bizarre when it, people, when scientists found this out, there's a prokaryotic chromosome inside the mitochondria. It's circular, which is the way prokaryotic chromosomes are. Whereas eukaryotic chromosomes are linear. It also is not wrapped in histones. It's only uh, eukaryotic chromosomes are wrapped in histones. It has other things that resemble a prokaryotic chromosome. Anyway, also, and divides as a bacterial divide. So what's going on here? Well, it's thought, this might be, is this on the next slide? So this is evidence that mitochondria and chloroplasts evolved from ancient free living prokaryotes that established residence within other larger host prokaryotes. This phenomenon where one species lives inside all species is a special type of symbiosis uh, um, called e endosymbiosis. And like the theory that describes this is called the endosymbiosis theory. Um, so you can have uh, symbiotic organisms living with you on the surface of your skin and in your, in your uh, uh, intestines. But those are really ectosymbionts. They're outside your body. Uh, these guys are not only inside your body, but inside our cells. So over time, mitochondria and chloroplast life became increasingly interdependent within the host prokaryote, eventually evolving into a single organism with its separate parts. And, and and this is how the modern eukaryotic cell uh, evolved by th this uh, endosymbiosis of ancient bacteria. And the other th interesting thing about the chromosome that's in uh, mitochondria is it's only from one of your parents. Your nuclear chromosomes are from both mom and dad. Your, your, your mitochondrial DNA is only from one. And can you figure out who, who that one would be? Well. It's mom, uh, because you have your mom's mitochondrial DNA. Uh, there were, uh, and that was because of those are the mitochondria that were in the, the, mo the mother's oocyte, her egg cell. 
the dad's sperm cells, they have mitochondria also, what's called a midpiece that fuels the flagella, but those mitochondria don't enter the egg. Only a sperm head enters the egg. So that's my mitochondria thrown away. Sunlight can be used to drive the photosynthesis of the sugars. Which major theme illustrated by this action? Well, it looks like pathways that transform energy and matter. Okay, so skeleton, this is how we started off with this chapter. Network of protein fibers is sent through the cytoplasm and serves both as a skeleton and muscles for the cell, functioning support and movement, giving shape to the cell. So mechanical support helps the cell maintain its shape and also moves things. It's actually like a, a transport. Uh, uh, it moves organelles around and it moves chromosomes around. Now there are, there are certain um, parts, uh, there, there's uh, uh, important um, cell skeleton protein fibers called, uh, called a microtubule, and they make up flagella, which allow cells to move, and uh, cilia, which allows things to push over the top of cells, and um, they form what's called spindle fibers, where you get into mitosis, that attach the chromosomes and pull, yank and pull chromosomes around. Well, there, microtubules, you just mentioned it. Several types of fibers, microtubules are hollow tubes of protein, and they're really important in moving things across cells, allowing cells to move, and um, uh, moving chromosomes. There's other type of fibers called intermediate uh, uh, filaments and microfilaments are thinner and solid, and they do other things. They give, they don't want to give the cell a particular shape. Uh, Okay, now the organelles use the cell skeleton for movement. Yeah, as, as I said, you can move things, uh, organelles through a cell using the microtubules. Okay, there's uh, microtubules in movement with a, an amoeba forming those, those arms that go out and, and moves. And you can see the microtubules in the cell skeleton. There's a, a microgram with special dyes that, that stain microtubules. Okay, some eukaryotic cells, microtubules are arranged in what we call flagella and cilia. I already mentioned uh, these extensions of a cell that aid in movement, either moving things over the surface of cells or actually allowing a cell to move with a flagella. Eukaryotic flagella propel cells through an undulating grip like motion. They're also membrane bonded organelles. So, um, so it's unfortunate, I think I mentioned this before, unfortunate that some bacteria have flagella, but they're not like eukaryotic flagella. So they should have used a different name because prokaryotic flagella and eukaryotic flagella are quite different. Uh, okay, they often occur singly, such as human sperm cells, but may appear in groups on the, out, uh, appear in groups on the outer surface of proteins. As a matter of fact, Sperm cells are the only human flagellate cell that has a flagella, the only one. But there's a lot of proteins, like the paramecium we saw earlier on, that have uh, 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 so proteins have flagella, but they also have cilia. Now, cilia are much smaller than flagella. They're like cell hairs. Um, and every human being has some, has some it's called ciliate epithelia. And uh, let me see uh, uh, whether this, uh, yeah, cilia, generally shorter or numerous than flagella, moving a coordinated, coordinated back and forth motion like the rhythmic oars of a rowing team. And they can propel uh, proteases through water. But also, they extend from non moving cells, and that's the cilia, cilia and epithelia in human beings. Particularly, the best example is cells lining the human trachea, and that's called a mucous membrane, and it's mucus put out on the surface of these cells that line the passageways in the lungs, and they're cilia, and the cilia move, and the cilia move the mucus, and uh, the cilia down in your lungs move mucus up to your throat. The 
cilia in your nasal passages move mucus down uh, to, to your throat. And they move them to the top of the trachea, which is called the larynx, and they come out of the larynx and fall behind the larynx. And there's a tube there called the esophagus, which is your food tube, so that every time you swallow, you are swallowing mucus from your nasal passages, from your lungs. And they go, that, that goes to your stomach and you digest the mucus. So what's the point? This is also actually called the mucociliary escalator. When you breathe in, you just don't breathe in gas. You breathe in all kinds of particles, all kinds of stuff. Dust particles, um, bacterial spores, uh, fungal spores, all kinds of things coming in there. Well, they can really get down to those little blind idiot sacs in your lungs where gas exchange occurs. You can really clog things up if you get all this junk down there. So what happens is all this junk that you breathe in probably hits the side of the passageway, the bronchioles and bronchi, and gets stuck in the mucus. So then the cilia bring the mucus up to uh, to your throat, it comes out of the larynx, you swallow it, it goes into your stomach, you digest your own mucus, and the stuff that you breathe in eventually is voided, right, in feces. So some of your feces is actually stuff that you breathe in. You get rid of it that way. Um, and, that's, and that's pretty important. Um, one other place that you'll find silly in human physiology, and actually in animal physiology, is it is only in females because the fallopian tubes are cilia and the egg oocyte just pops out of the uh, ovary and is caught by what's called a fimbria and it's a cilia and it brings this, the oocyte in and moves the oocyte along the fallopian tube to, uh, towards the uterus uh, because oocytes they can't move they don't have flagella they can't move and they have to get to the uterus now, if, they, if, they, if there happens to be sperm in the fallopian tube, that's where fertilization takes place. And then this becomes a zygote and it moves down and implants in the uterus. If there is no sperm present, the oocyte moves down a little bit, but then uh, disintegrates within 48 hours if there's no um, a sperm present. So. so you'll find that lying in the fallopian tubes in female ciliated uh, epithelium. Okay, there's a flagellum in a, in a human sperm cell, huh? and there's cilia lining the respiratory tract uh, also. So they're both made of the same thing, a microtubule arrangement, but just the flagellum is much longer than the cilia. And flagella are usually used to transport cells. Cilia are used to see people to uh, transport things uh, across cell surfaces. Okay, so because human sperm rely on flagella for movement, easy to understand why problems with flagella can sometimes lead to male infertility. You swimmers can't really swim well. So some men with this type of, uh, have a certain type of hereditary sterility also suffer from respiratory problems because of, de of a defect in the structure of the flagella and cilia. So they have a trouble making good swimmers and they're going to have trouble moving this mucus in your lungs. Also, smoking sort of like uh, uh, paralyzes the cilia, so they don't work as well. And this is where the smoker's cough comes in. We have to cough up that stuff rather than having the cilia uh, move it because they're damaged by cigarette smoke. OK, so let's uh, stop. Uh, uh, right there, and uh, this is going to be uh, 106 uh, cells two. So I'm going to stop this recording, and I'll uh, pick you up with uh, another video later on in the same channel. Uh, so I'll see you later.